Welcome to the first part of the Aurora hands-on training. This video should be watched before you complete your in-person session with the CAT facility. Starting out with a quick tour of everything in the lab, you'll first want to make sure that you're at the correct Aurora. All Auroras in our facility are the same, so we distinguish them with colors. You can see from the sign above the monitor that we are currently looking at the Aurora Red. Next to that sign, there are a few additional resources that I want to point out. The main one is the chart that gives us the expected peak detectors of the floor force. And I'll show you how to use that when we're in the hands-on training session. There's also a binder that contains written instructions for a lot of what we'll be going through in the hands-on training session. And there's a laminated quick guide, which can be useful as well. The last resource or tool that I want to point out is taped to the front of the Aurora. If you need to add a certain volume to a 5 mil flow tube, you can just hold up an empty flow tube and then estimate the volume with the lines on the paper. Here I'm estimating out 3 mils so that I can appropriately wash the Aurora. Now for where things are located in the lab, you can look behind the Auroras to find the carboy to fill the shathe tank that contains milliq water. Then if we walk around the lab bay here, there's a black fridge and this contains the QC beads. The vial that you want to grab is the one that says SpectroFlow QC beads. It also says SciTech on it. These are the beads that we'll be using in the hands-on training session to run the daily QC. So when you arrive at the Aurora, you'll definitely want to check the sheath and waste tanks. There are two tanks on the side of the Aurora. There's the supply tank, which is another name for sheath tank, and there's the waste tank. The important thing to note is that unlike the Fortesses and LSR2, where the sheath buffer is PBS, the sheath buffer for the Aurora is water. Before you start a session on the Aurora, you should check these tanks. If you need to open them up, they are not pressurized, so you can just unscrew them easily. If the supply tank is running low, then fill it with milliq water. And if the waste tank is full, you can dump it into the sink. You might find it a little bit easier to unclip the tubing on the tanks, especially if you need to move them. To unclip that tubing, it's pretty straightforward. You just push that metal part in and it will remove the quick connect. To reconnect it, you just push straight down until it clicks it into place. Now for powering on the Aurora, I will include the video sound just so you can hear how loud the Aurora gets when we push the power button. The power button is this silver button here. Once the Aurora is on, you should hear a pretty significant noise. Loading tubes onto the Aurora is pretty easy. You might find that some of our users close everything up so you won't immediately see the tube loader. This black component is actually part of the plate loader. You don't necessarily need to use the cover, but for some reason, a lot of our users will leave the cover closed like it is showing right now. To get to the tube loader, you just need to flip the front cover down and the tube loader is located here above the plate loader. Right now, you can see that the 40 tube rack is set up. If you arrive and it is set up like this, then you'll want to also power on the plate loader separately. The power button is located in the back here. Once you turn it on, you just have to give it a minute and it will eventually eject the stage. Now that the stage is ejected, you can just remove the rack. There aren't any clips, so just take it out. If you're not going to use the plate loader at all, you can turn off the power to the plate loader. For manual tubes, just put the tube on once the plate loader is ejected. To remove a tube, all you need to do is pull straight down. And to load a new tube, you just push straight up and it will click into place. Once you start acquiring your sample, you will see the sit will extend down into the tube itself and it will start sucking up your sample. The important thing to know is that if the sit is visible, you shouldn't really be fiddling around with the tube like removing it from the instrument. But once the sit is retracted back inside of the cytometer, then you are free to remove the tube and put the next one on. 
Here's an overview of the startup workflow. First, you're going to check the sheath and waste tanks and make sure that the Aurora is turned on. Then log into Windows using your CNET ID and open up the SpectroFlow application. Then you can assess the status of the daily QC, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then you can acquire your samples. Let's get into the SpectroFlow demo. So I've already logged into Windows using my CNET ID, and I'm going to open SpectroFlow, which should be a shortcut on the desktop. For our facility, all of our users have the same username and password for SpectroFlow. To find that login information, you'll want to look for a white sticker stuck to the front of the monitor. Once you're into the software, there are six different modules. It doesn't matter which one you select, but usually I recommend selecting the QC and setup first. Even if you're not the first person of the day, I would at least check this and make sure that the daily QC was run and it has passed. You can verify the date, time, and report status here. If you'd like to view the report for any reason, you can select this report button down here. This will show you the list of previous reports at the top, and if you select one, it will populate the report that is shown below. To get back to that previous screen where you can run the QC, you can select the same button which toggles back and forth between the two screens. When we go through the in-person training, I'll show you how to run the daily QC. Moving on to running samples, you're, this is done over in the acquisition module. In this module, there are a few different options here. I'm first going to describe the different options and then I'll walk you through the new experiment wizard, which is what most people will choose from this menu. The first option on the list is default. When you select this, it just goes directly into the experiment and it's the quickest way to run a sample. I only find this useful for a few specific instances. It can be useful if you're running titration experiments and I have a separate video on how to set that up. Back in the main menu, the My Experiments option is where you can locate all of the experiments that are on this cytometer right now. For data management in our facility, we do delete experiments from here pretty regularly. Roughly once a week, a staff member will go in, open up this window, and basically delete anything that is older than 30 days. So don't expect your experiments to hang out here for long periods of time. Your FCS files will be pushed to the data server, so you shouldn't have to worry about losing any of your files. But if you have all of your markers and tubes labeled and you're repeating the same experiment and want to keep those labels, you could technically right click on your experiment and duplicate it without data but that is not necessarily the best way to go about doing things. The better way is to make a template and then that will save that in the template experiments here. And we don't delete anything out of this menu so you can create a new experiment from a saved template. Most people are going to want to use the new experiment wizard. So I'm gonna go click on new. The first thing is name. This is going to be the folder that exists on our data server. I do recommend including some version of your name or initials and the date and then some sort of description of your experiment, whatever you want it to be. Below that is description. This only exists in SpectroFlow. I have not seen this information anywhere on the data server or when you open up the files in Flojo. But if you come up with a use for it, you're welcome to use it. On the bottom half of this window, we have the floor for library and the selection, which is going to contain the floor fours in the panel for your specific experiment. So we have to move things from the left box into the right box. You can access the floor force inside of the library by either clicking on the little arrowhead to open up the folder, or you can also use this type to filter, which is my preference for finding floor force. This will automatically show you the floor force matching your search. If you have something like Alexa floor 647, usually typing the number is going to be the fastest route to go. Once you find what you're looking for, you can just select it and click add, or you can also double click on the item and it will be added to the right selection panel. You can see that spectral flow will count the floor force in the selection panel, which is handy when you have a large panel. I'm going to click next at the bottom to move on to the next tab. You'll see at the top, there are five tabs that we're going to work our way through. In the groups tab here, you're going to tell SpectroFlow which tubes or wells you want in your experiment. First, verify that your carrier type is your preferred method. You can select whether you want manual tubes, the tube rack, or a plate. I'm just going to select the manual tube option. 
Most people are going to want a reference group in their experiment, so typically I start by selecting the Add Reference Group button. By default, SpectroFlow is going to give you one tube for every color that you have entered into your experiment. If you want more tubes than that, you can easily add them at the bottom here. Maybe you brought cells and beads for one of your colors. You can change the control type from cells to beads. If you have more than one control for a single floor for, like I have here for BV421, you will be able to select which file you want to use when you go through the unmixing wizard later on. You can add labels for your tubes here, which I do recommend doing because it's always a good idea to add as much information as possible into the files. The last column here is for negative control, which is also called a universal negative. I'll show you how that works in the training, so we'll skip that one for now and just click save. And now you can see the tubes that I just added. You also probably want to include some fully stained tubes, so I'll select add group, and then by default it'll give us a group and a tube. If you're like me and like to put a bunch of information in your file names, I'll just point out that this tube will be named group1 underscore tube1 underscore date underscore time dot FCS. So whatever you put in the group name will be added to all the tubes inside of that group. I like to include something descriptive like wild type or knockout or the name of the tissue, stimulated or unstimulated, whatever makes sense for your experiment. To add more tubes, it's a two-part mechanism. You can increase this value to whatever you want and then click the Add Tube button and it will add the number of tubes that you indicated. To rename a tube, you just double click on the name itself and you can type whatever you want. This works for any text that can be altered throughout the entire software, just click on it to make changes. I'm just going to add one more group quickly so I can demonstrate the next tab better. So clicking next, this is where we label our fully stained samples. So we already did the labels for the reference group that is accomplished in the previous window. We cannot make any modifications to the reference group tubes in this specific window, but for the rest of our tubes, we have a few different options. So if I type in a label just for this tube, then that value will only be applied to a single tube. If I instead type my label at the group level, then it will apply to all tubes within this group. If I want the label to apply to all groups in my entire experiment, then I type my label at the top here. Another trick is if you're typing in your label and then you hit the tab key, you will bump over to the next one in the row so that you can continue typing the next label. Moving on, the fourth tab is keywords. And honestly, no one really uses this one. Anyone interested in keywords usually adds them in Flojo later. But if you do want to add keywords in this software, just let me know. The last tab is acquisition. This is where you tell the software when you want to automatically stop recording your tubes. You can obviously do a manual stop if you want to stop recording before you hit this auto stop. The first column here allows you to select your preferred worksheet from the drop down menu. There are really only two options, which you can see in parentheses at the end of each worksheet name, either raw or unmixed. Right now I haven't unmixed any data, so I like to just leave this as the default raw worksheet. These last three columns here, events to record, stopping time, and stopping volume, are how SpectroFlow determines when to automatically stop recording your sample. Whichever one of these parameters your sample hits first is when it will stop recording. So with the stopping time and stopping volume being set very high right now, it is likely that these tubes would stop when they hit 5,000 events. The other component of this is stopping gate. So right now it's set to all events. This gets combined with the events to record. So with this current setup right now, these samples will likely stop when 5,000 total events are recorded. If you change this from all events to P1, now it's set to stop if there are 5,000 events within the P1 gate. If you do change this gate, just be very careful about not changing the storage gate. If you change the storage gate to P1, this will set it so that when your FCS files are generated, it will only contain events inside of the P1 gate, and it will delete all events outside of the P1 gate. If you want to create a template for this experiment, you can use the save as template button, or you can just click the save and open button, which is what I'm going to do. 
there is another save as button, which is located here. And if you click this button, this is also another way to create a template. Now for this experiment that we currently have open, if you decide later that you wanna make any changes, you can always reopen that window that I just closed and change anything at any time. You just have to click the edit button and it will bring you back to this entire wizard. So don't worry if you want to make any further changes. As a side note, I wanna also let you know that you can create an experiment template from any web browser. Just go to spectrum.scitechbio.com and then there's this create experiment button located here. Once you click on that, it pulls up a online SpectroFlow experiment builder. This is pretty much the exact same thing that we just went through in SpectroFlow. And at the end of this, you can create a template, which you can then import onto the Aurora yourself. Keep in mind that USB drives are not allowed in our facility, so you will need to transfer the file through a cloud-based service or server. Okay, back in SpectroFlow, I'm going to walk you through all the different components of this acquisition experiment window. This part of the software should feel very similar to working on the Fortessas. The tubes are all listed here. It does have the same quirk that the Fortessas do, so you really want to be paying attention to where that green arrow is pointing. If I click Start right now, it's going to preview the tube that has the green arrow, not the tube that has the gray highlight. For acquisition control, it is very similar to the Fortessas. Start will preview your samples. Record will save them in an FCS file. Stop will manually stop your recording or preview. Pause would allow you to change the flow rate without stopping the tube, but that's not going to produce good data if you're in the middle of recording a tube. So be cautious about that button. Restart is useful when you are changing the forward and side scatter and you want to refresh the data that's on your plot. And finally, there's an option for a sit flush if you want to do that manually. You should know that once you remove the tube from the Aurora, it should do a sit flush automatically. So that sit flush button is just if you want an extra one or if for some reason it didn't do the automatic one. For flow rate, we have low, medium, and high, very comparable to the Fortessas. There's also a volumetric counter where you can track the rate of your samples. The expected flow rates for this are listed on our website on the page dedicated to the Aurora. If you want more advanced information, you can scroll down to see other things like the event rate and abort rate. In the instrument control panel, user setting can be selected here. This section with all of the data plots is the worksheets. Right now we're looking at the default raw worksheet. We have our different plots here. If we wanna make any modifications to these plots, you just right click on the plot and select properties. And then we have all kinds of things that we can change. So if you prefer to run your side scatter in linear, then you would just go ahead and change that to linear here. If you select a plot that has fluorophores on the axis, you get a few more options. I wanna point out that the default scaling doesn't always make your data look great, so you might find that auto scaling is better. However, the one thing to know about auto scaling is that when you are actively running a sample, the auto scaling might make the populations look like they're vibrating. But everything will look fine once you've finished recording the sample. I also want to point out that at the top of each plot, there is a label. This one says all events. So this tells us that the data in the plot is all events. There's already a gate on this plot. And if I double click inside that P1 gate, I'll get a new plot. And the top label now says P1, which indicates that we're now only looking at the events inside the P1 gate. This can also be changed in the plot properties window. Just make sure you are selecting the plot that you want to make changes to. If you want to add more plots and gates to the worksheet, there are a bunch of buttons at the top. These are pretty standard, and if you aren't quite sure what each one is, you should be able to hover the mouse over the button for a description. If you want a gating hierarchy, it is this button here. You can change the names of the population within this window if you wish by just double clicking on the name and typing. In general, I wouldn't recommend doing too much to the default worksheets just because every user will see them and could make changes. If you do want to draw gates for your specific experiment, I would instead recommend making your own worksheet. You can create a new one with this quick add button, or you can open the worksheet menu over here. Most users do this after they've unmixed their data and want to draw some gates on their unmixed data. 
For that, you can select new unmixed worksheet, either in this menu or with the quick add button. You'll want to change the name of this worksheet. Again, I always recommend starting with your initials or name and then whatever descriptive information you want to include. Right now you can see that this worksheet is not saved and I can tell this because there's an asterisk next to the name of the worksheet. Anytime you see an asterisk in the software, it means that the item is not saved. To save the worksheet, you use either this save button or you can save it from the worksheet menu. After the worksheet is saved, you could locate it in the future from this worksheet template menu. So that's the basic introduction to SpectroFlow. In your hands-on training session with me, we're going to go through a typical workflow for running your samples. And I'll also go through the actual unmixing wizard with some data. So you'll see how that portion of the software works later on.